You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Willis Podcast. Before I get to today's episode, I just want to say one very cool thing, and that is I just applied to be the podcast producer slash talent booker for the James Altucher Show. And if you don't know what the James Altucher Show is, I've actually had him on the podcast uh, a few a few episodes ago, and uh, the episode was actually titled Choose Yourself, which is the title of also of James's book. And if I get that job and become the talent booker slash podcast producer, it would open up so many doors for me. And if you've been a loyal listener to this show, you know how much I, I've always mentioned James. And it would be so cool to work on another podcast show. I'd still be doing this one, by the way. So if you feel so inclined, please tweet at James. I've included his Twitter handle in the show notes. And just tell him just one time. I don't have to bombard him. But just tell him that I would be a really good fit for the show. And uh, I've actually pitched him three different guests um, which is uh, one guest I'm actually having on very soon, which is uh, Matt Burns, a.k.a. Sick Nick Mondo, who's a former professional wrestler turned filmmaker. Uh, Don Barris, who actually has been on the show as well. He's Jimmy Kimmel's warm-up uh, uh, comedian, comedian, and he's also made one of the best movies ever in Winnie City Heat. And the third person is uh, Steve Maxwell, my former Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach. He's been on the Joe Rogan podcast numerous times. Uh, awesome, awesome guy. Very interesting guy. Uh, so those are the three people I pitched to him, to, to James have on the show, along with my resume and, and everything else. So again, if I did get this job, it would be unbelievable. And uh, so I want to say thank you, everyone, for any support uh, you or any, any sort of uh, good feelings, good faith, good vibes, whatever you want to call it, sent my way. So back to this podcast... On this week's edition of the podcast, I have a really cool guest, an award-winning filmmaker, TV host, and Amazon number one bestseller for her book, So LA, a Hollywood memoir. We're going to talk about all the good stuff, Dead Central, hosting shows on the BBC, how she got all these really cool gigs, growing up in LA, surrounded by celebrities with two celebrity parents, all that and much, much more. This is episode 167 with guest... Stacey Lane Wilson. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. very interesting uh, background and you have a very interesting sort of way you've got into the film industry. You were basically, you know, you were born into the, into this industry um, cause you have, you wrote a book. Uh, so LA, a Hollywood memoir, uncensored tales by the rock star and pinup model. And you talk about obviously, and, and like you say in your bio, you are a unicorn because not only were you born and raised in LA, you're still in LA. So, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, being you know being born in L.A., do you feel that you were just basically you had you felt compelled, or maybe even sort of sort of like driven to, to go into the film industry? Um, you know, not necessarily, and it didn't happen until fairly late in my life. But um, I feel like there is a lot to the argument of nature versus nurture. But I got on both counts, nature and nurture in the creative world. So I'm just a creative person and that's how my mind works. So I do feel I was predisposed to doing something in not necessarily the industry, quote unquote, but just doing things that are more creative than technical, say, or mathematical. That's just not my thing. And my parents are both the same. So I feel like um, that I just inherited sort of that predisposition to be a storyteller. My dad is a storyteller through his music, my mother through her writing. So I feel like that's just why I am what I am. So when you were sort of growing up, you know, and I imagine, you know, obviously growing up in that area, uh, did you see like a lot? Did you go to school or maybe even know like uh, famous people? Like, did you go like hang around famous people or maybe were they coming by the house? The reason I bring that up, uh, Stacey, is I, I actually had a, a guest on the show 
uh, and he actually, when he was younger, he celebrities were calling the house, and um, they used to call uh-huh. him on the landline phone, and he he would answer, and he'd go, "Why is Mo from the Three Stooges calling me or calling my dad?" I mean, <laughs> you know why? You know, so did, did you have uh-huh. anything like that? Well, apparently, I don't remember it because I was quite young, but my mother actually had an illicit affair with Bobby Kennedy. Um, And so he would call and come over and, uh, you know, apparently we had conversations, but I was only, I think I was like two when he died. So I don't remember much about that, but apparently I could hold my own in a conversation with Bobby Kennedy. And then my mom was also friends with Alan Sherman, who was... um, a singer songwriter kind of the uh novelty uh comedic songs he put out albums you know when that kind of thing was popular um one of his songs was hello Bada, hello fada you know some kind of thing about the camp uh i don't know the whole thing but so he and i were apparently friends and i don't remember that either but as i got a little bit older i did talk to some of my dad's friends like i do remember that um glenn campbell was his neighbor up the street in sherman oaks california so my father being a musician knew a lot of the really great um singer songwriters of the era so i remember talking to them to some degree but when I was a little kid, I was really, really interested in horses and horseback riding. So that was kind of horses were my best friends, really. <laughs> so, so did you when when you were a little kid and you were around horses? Did you actually want to like maybe go into the equestrian or maybe become like a like a actual like uh, something to do with horses more than anything else? I did to some degree, but then I looked at my bank account. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't a good idea. Uh, but no, when I was a little kid, I was definitely um, really, really into it. I showed horses. And in fact, one of my main competitors when I was showing ponies um, was Hervé Villachez, who was tattoo on the uh, Fantasy Island TV show. He had ponies being of diminutive stature, I suppose that's why. But so, um, so I used to show and um, really was into training horses um, for a long time in my life. And I actually did start out with that sort of as a business goal. And I did it for quite a few years, but it just really is a drain on the old bank account. And as much as I love horses, I eventually had to say goodbye to them. And I still love horses, but I just don't own them anymore. And um, But it was a really great sort of a... a a juxtaposition for me as as a young girl growing up in Los Angeles with my parents being who they are, that I was able to have that outdoor life and to really be brought down to earth, so to speak, working with horses because they don't care who your parents are or who you are. They just care that you're going to treat them well and that you're going to, um, you know, be a good person. And that is really important when it comes to working with animals and training horses. And I feel like that has filtered out into my everyday life and talking to people and being in business and being a writer and all those things really gave me a great foundation as a kid. So when you mentioned they don't care who your parents are, did, did any, did you ever find out like when growing up or even when you're in your teenage years, uh, you know, did anyone ever, you know, it's almost like, Hey, could I ever, you know, get to do something with your dad or Hey, could I ever get to do something Mm -hmm. with your mom? Did you ever experience that growing up? To a degree. I mean, my mom is not, you know, what you'd say is famous, but she was a pinup model back in the day. And um, it was kind of funny, you know, when you're growing up and you're especially those awkward early teenage years where you really don't want to stand out or be different. So, you know, people looking at my mom's centerfolds or whatever, my friends, (laughs) it was kind of funny and awkward, but but it was also cool. And as far as my father goes, um, he is Don Wilson, the guitarist for The Ventures. And that is the number one selling instrumental band of all time. They did songs like Hawaii Five O and Pipeline and Wipeout and whatnot. So, um, you know, back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, as I was a teenage girl growing up, a lot of the guys in school knew who the ventures were because they were learning how to play guitar and whatnot. But personally, I was very much into harder rock like Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and groups like that. So to me, like the ventures were not exactly uncool, but not exactly, you know, my cup of tea as far as music went. So it was kind of funny to hear my friends say how much, you know, they really loved the ventures. And I was like, really? My dad's famous? I didn't really 
see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those things. Like I was saying, about the the guy I had on the podcast who whose uh, father was was a was an entertainment lawyer. And he would say, you know, why are all these people calling the house? And he kept saying, Dad, you know, what is going on here? And uh, mm-hmm. it was just, it's just stuff like that. It's just so interesting, you know, always and growing up and you, you're your parent, your parents are, you know, in demand or or people want to meet them. And it's, you know, a, a, when you're younger, you're like, why? Why do all these people want to come meet my parents? What is going on here? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to have perspective on your parents when you're that young. Of course, now I do. And especially Having written my book, it's given me a lot of great, um, you know, like I say, perspective of years and to really appreciate their talents. Um, but, you know, to me, they still are just my parents. <laughs> so, uh, so Stacey, when you, when you were growing up, you know, you, you mentioned that you, you got bit by the sort of filmmaking bug a little later in life. So, you know, around, you know, what age were you when you finally decided that you wanted to, to sort of go into the, uh, to the film industry? Well, I actually started off as an entertainment reporter, and I fell into that more or less through writing horror novels. I was approached by a couple of horror websites like Horror.com, and um, Cinefantastique magazine had also approached me to see if I wanted to be an L.A. correspondent to write movie reviews. And it really wasn't anything that I had endeavored to do, although I always liked movies, Um And I found out that I really had an aptitude for it. And uh, so here we are, like, you know, 16 years later, I got it started in 2001. And so I'm still doing that, still reviewing films and still interviewing actors while also pursuing my own career as a filmmaker. And that actually started just through being inspired by an Edgar Allan Poe poem in uh, 2010 I believe that was the first yeah that's my first foray into filmmaking was in 2010 with a short film a triptych of three short films based on Annabelle Lee and um, I just knew actors through my other career as a as a film journalist and um So that's how that all just kind of came together pretty organically. It wasn't something that one day I woke up and said, I'm going to be a filmmaker. (laughs) So um, it just seemed like a natural uh, evolution from what I had been doing. And the fact that I did write fiction before in the 90s, those two things, the, the marrying of storytelling and technology and then a basis of knowledge in film is really what I feel led to led to it. And um so since then, I've made several short films and also wrote and directed two feature films. And um, it's still a part-time thing for me, although I do enjoy it. Writing is still my number one love. So uh, do you write your, you know, your, the, your own scripts that, that you go on to direct and maybe even produce? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I actually, though, my two feature films, which were... Um, produced by Blanc Bean Productions, which is Michael Bean, the actor, and his wife, Jennifer Blanc, and they're both actors, but um, they both got in, started a production company. And the two films that I wrote were based on ideas from one of their partners who gave me sort of the skeleton of an idea, and I was predisposed already to liking the subject matter of both films. So it worked out really well because it almost feels like they're my creations, but really they are based on stories by uh, Loni Ruman, who's one of the producing partners. And then, um, so I wrote the scripts um, to, you know, specific locations and a specific budget, and then was um, given the wonderful opportunity to direct them. And it was really, you know, a great experience. They are super, you know, run and gun, Roger Corman style uh grindhousey sort of movies so we actually shot both features uh at five days each so you know basically five 12 hour days shooting about 17 pages a day and um i think it was really a great um sort of introduction into directing features for me because it was really um challenging but in a fun way so i think now that i've done this i can do just about anything so it's really a great confidence builder too you know, it's funny you actually bring them up. I actually helped, um, I actually helped them with a a Kickstarter they were doing. Uh, I think it was the Night Visitor. 
I think. Uh, yes. Was, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. They've actually done a couple of sequels to that now since. Really? Uh, because I, I yeah. actually, yeah, that, that's, it's a small world. I tell you, Stacy, doing this podcast, uh, it, it's a smaller and smaller world. <laughs> that's good. So, uh, so when you first started, you know, uh, you know, wanting to do movies, I, I you mentioned you didn't just wake up one day and want to become a filmmaker. Um, Mm-mm. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, I, I feel that most people who want to make a movie or, or, you know, even go into this uh, industry, they usually have almost like this, uh, almost like, uh, a, a predisposition into it. It's almost like they have like this itch that they just need to scratch. And, and you know, when they go to make a movie, it, it's always one of two things that I, that I found it's either that they do the run and gun style. It's where it's like, no, no, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. They either do one of two things. They do the, they do um, like no planning at all, or they plan this thing so much that it becomes analysis <laughs> through paralysis yeah. and they don't do it uh-huh. and they never get to film it. So it, it, yeah. you know, it, it's one of those two things. So, but I mean, once you start getting into it more and more, you start building a team, you start building a whole like network. Now, I mm-hmm. think your story is different because I think you you had a, a a better network going into it because again, you're in L.A., you're doing you making all these connections, you're you're reviewing movies, you're a movie reporter. So when you went to make your first movie, you know, do you feel that you already had a, a better footing or a better understanding than than maybe the average filmmaker? Well, that is probably on a, you know, case by case basis. Like you say, everyone brings their own measure of talent and their own sort of life experience into creating something as ephemeral, really, as a film, even though a film, you know, does last forever. It's still, when it's coming together, it's kind of an alchemy. So each person brings their own thing into it. Um, So we're all unique. But I do feel really fortunate that I know the great talented people that I do know. And in Los Angeles, there is, you know, obviously a greater concentration of choices, you know, people that you know, and also just through being um, an entertainment reporter and knowing these people uh, on a different level, I really kind of already knew what their work ethic would be and what their sensibilities are. And um, so when bringing together, say, you know, my, my first cast for my short film um the star of that who's sort of our edgar Allan poe character is ogre from skinny puppy and i had met him through being an entertainment reporter when i covered his feature musical film called repo the genetic opera which is directed by darren bowsman so we already had sort of a connection and a rapport and i knew the things that he liked and he knew the things that I liked. So there is a good shorthand there, which you really need when you're working on a low budget or a no budget film, because you don't really have time to get acquainted with someone. You kind of have to dive in and, and already know what you're dealing with. So having a pool of people like that already and um, just being friends, I think really helps. So I would say, yes, that's a long answer to your (laughs) short question. (laughs) No, no, I, I completely understand, Stacey. I, I tend to ask very open-ended questions, um, you know, to, just to sort of get a, a good response, you know, that, uh, you know a, a longer response. And, and, that, and I always think that's a good thing. And I just want to follow that up by asking, when, when, when you made your first film, you know, what, what were some of mm-hmm. the biggest takeaways for you that you put into your next film? Well, I actually, although I'm known in the horror and genre world, and Edgar Allan Poe certainly is horror, but I also feel like it's um, an arty sensibility where you can really stretch the imagination and interpret the subject matter as you like. So my next film after that was also very experimental and having the basis of shooting The Key to Annabelle Lee, which is my first short film, I really felt freed up to be even more artistic and experimental. My next film um, was called The Night Plays Tricks, which is based on um, a Bob Dylan song called Visions of Johanna. And it's almost um, Maya Darren-esque. If you've seen Meshes of the Afternoon, you know, it's kind of like that. So I really felt confident that I could express myself in a sort of slightly opaque artistic way and yet still get a story across and having a good editor really helps with that. 
and my editor and DP on uh, that second film is Justin Cruz. And so it's really nice having a DP who can also edit, which is also the case with my very latest, most recent short film. So I feel like the, the DP is kind of editing in his mind as he's shooting and having that artistic sensibility like I have is really makes for a great collaboration. So that is what sort of spurred me on to continue making films was to know that I could still be artistic because to me, style in cinema speaks volumes. And that is really what I wanted to be able to do. So that really gave me the confidence to move forward. So you, you mentioned your latest film. Uh, I mean, could you, could mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. It is called Psychotherapy, and it stars Brooke Lewis and um, Ricky Dean Logan, and it's sort of a two-hander. It's it's a very short film. It's just under 10 minutes, and uh, Brooke had brought me on to write and direct it as sort of a showcase for her because she is known for doing sci-fi and comedies and things that are pretty light, and this is more of a psychological thriller. So she wanted me to write something to her strengths as a dramatic actor. And, um, and then she brought on uh, Ricky, who is also a very good actor, but I hadn't actually met him before we started shooting. So that's another fun challenge that I enjoy too. On the flip side of working with people that I know is also just um, sort of diving in and having fun with people that, um, that I don't have experience with. So that's the part of the excitement of making a film And um, so this short film is sort of uh, Brooke and my, we we both love uh, Brian De Palma films. So it's kind of our homage to Dress to Kill a little bit with the psychiatrist and the patient having um, a verbal tete-a-tete. And so far the film has won um, several awards, both for acting, directing, and writing. And it's only been on the festival circuit for a few months. So it's very encouraging. And our uh, DP slash editor, Stefan Colson, is really, really super talented. And so all those elements together, that's a fun thing as opposed to, say, writing a novel where it's very much just with you uh, and it's your, you know, sort of everything is, is contained within the writer to see how a script that I wrote evolves and sort of flowers with the different talents of, of, of the, of the other people. So it's just a different kind of satisfaction, but it's, they're both really interesting uh, ways of expressing yourself artistically. And so, yeah, this latest short film is uh, probably the, one of the least artistic shorts that I've done. It's more linear and more, like I said, it's a, it's a thriller, but I was able to add some visual flourishes that I wanted to. So it's been really great. And, and that, that's amazing because, you know, it goes on with what I was, what I was trying to get at before was, you know, always bring something new from your old project to your new project. And what I mean by that is you bring the experience, you bring confidence. And I think, I think a lot of filmmakers, or even when I see a lot of, read a lot of books or, or what have you about filmmaking, they don't really talk about confidence. And, and if you don't really have any confidence you know, in yourself or the, or the project or the script or anything else, you know, I think that shows. It almost becomes like you're like, oh, okay, you know what I mean? It kind of, you, you end up getting maybe mm-hmm. even a very passive sort of feel for the whole thing. You know what I mean? And I think confidence is, is something that, that a lot of people don't talk about. And, and, and one of the ways that I feel that, that filmmakers can build confidence is is by small victories. And what I mean by that is you make a project – Maybe even going out, like Mark Duplass says, going out with your friends on a, on a weekend and making a movie for a hundred bucks, or, um, or or doing something else, or maybe winning a, a local contest or something like that, and then sort of being able to sort of parlay that into something else, if you know what I mean, Stacy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's like when you're learning how to swim, you don't dive into the deep end; <laughs> you kind of stand on the steps for a little while, and then you wade into the shallow end, and. And then as you see that you're not going to drown, you, you go a little bit further and a little bit further. So, yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, I, sometimes, you know, I see as an entertainment reporter, uh, I don't really know what kind of connections these people have, but sometimes you see a, a film director who's given his very first project and it's a blockbuster with, say, you know, Warner Brothers or Sony. I'm like, wow, that must be really intimidating, you know. 
<laughs> you know, Stacy, you and I have the same uh, uh, mentality with that. I I have seen other people uh, who've gotten projects, uh, maybe not even blockbusters, but it's like their first time film, and they walk out and they and they have like a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand uh-huh. or a million. Yeah. And like I a sit, fortune. Yeah, yeah, and I and I sit there and I go. How did they get that money? Like, where did they get that mm-hmm. from? Uh, you know, I once knew a person who who basically his first time out, he got a a bunch of grants and stuff like that. And I said, you know, uh, you know, how do you how did you do that? And he he basically said he had a uh, a girlfriend who at the time her mother was very big into uh, she did a lot of charity fundraising and she knew a ton of people and that's how he got these grants. Uh, and basically they're just, they're not even grants that you like apply to, so to speak. They're grants that, you know, if you pitch to them at, a, at you know, at certain intervals, they'll be like, okay, you could have this money. You could have that money. Well, that's wow. how they raise some of the money. But, but just to go back to what we were talking about, you know, yeah, some people are out of left field and suddenly they're directing the next Godzilla film for like $200 million, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me personally, just knowing my um, very autonomous freelancer personality, I would be not as happy working with uh, a huge budget like that where so much hinges on the success of the film as opposed to the joy of making the film and creating something that you like. Um, I don't know that I would really feel you know, I definitely know I wouldn't feel comfortable having, you know, producers breathing down my neck every day about, you know, how much money is being spent and, you know, look at all they're writing on this. That's a lot of pressure to me. Um, for my part, filmmaking, of course, I want to be able to make enough money to pay my rent and so far so good. But uh, I don't really aspire to be a huge, you know, a director making a blockbuster. However, having said that, I am really proud of Patty Jenkins, who's directed Wonder Woman, and she's done a great job with a huge blockbuster like that. I had interviewed her several years ago when she did Monster, and um, that was sort of like a, a very you know personal film that she was able to put her own stamp on, and she's uh, weathered the storms, and look at her now. So I think it's great. It's really a good time, actually, to be a, f- a female creator in the film world, and uh Hopefully I'll be able to uh, glean a little bit of that good fortune myself as I move ahead ahead in my career. You know, I was just talking about Patty with her cinematographer from Monster, uh, uh, Stephen Bernstein, and he and I were Mm -hmm. talking about Patty. And and we were just talking about, uh, you know, Wonder Woman and everything like that. So it's just, again, you brought that up. It's just a small, again, I, I know I keep repeating this, Stacey, but it's a very small world. It's good. I like it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but 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 it is yeah, it it, it is a good time uh, uh you know for for uh female directors and you know uh female producers too. Um because even like somebody like Gail Hurd on The Walking Dead. Um you know, I, mm-hmm. I think she kind of sort of I, I don't know how many interviews she does. I don't know maybe she's one of those people that sort of gets in the background. But, you know, it, it's it's just, you know, it, it is I, I can see more opportunities coming down the pike. And there's also great things, too. Like um, I have to mention um, Carol Dean, who runs the, the Grants from the Hearts Productions. Uh, she's phenomenal. And uh, there's also great people out there like like um, uh, Jennifer Grassani, uh, Lee Jessup, uh, Plara Alessandra, all, all these great people out there working, uh, you know, right out in your neck of the woods, Stacey in L.A. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I just attended the Etheria Film Festival last weekend, which has been going on for about five years now. Previous to that, it was called Viscera, where it was more focused on horror, and now it's more genre, you know, based with different elements of that. And that is um, Heidi Honeycutt and Stacey Hammond, who run that festival, which is pretty much, uh, you know, focused on the female. In fact, it, they, each film has to either be written, directed, or produced by a woman. And um, this past weekend, uh, Roger Corman came out and presented the Lifetime Achievement Award to Stephanie Rothman, who was his protege, and uh, she actually directed the first three um, New World Pictures, I think, and this is back in the early 70s. So Roger has always given people, uh, regardless of gender or race, their big breaks. And early on, you know, before it was quote unquote trendy 
Um, so it's really nice to see a woman like Stephanie Rothman being recognized today for the work that she did, which is really pretty pioneering in the early 1970s. But I mean, you could even go back on this subject to uh, the early uh, era of, of talkies and silent films when women like Mary Pickford were producing. And it was a lot less uh, gender biased then for a short period of time until real money started coming in and then it was you know taken over by by males but um i I feel like you know we're definitely experiencing a bit of a renaissance here so it's a good time to be a filmmaker period but even better to be a female filmmaker right now so i'm feeling pretty good about where i am yeah, and uh, you know it's interesting to see where where all this is going to. I'm always interested to see too, Stacy, where you know Netflix is going, where Hulu's going, where all these mm-hmm. avenues are going. I mean, I, I've heard so many different things that are rumbling down the pike, and it's just also interesting right now, um, and, and how everything's sort of coming together. Oh yeah, there are a lot more women working in television than film. Film is sort of you know still um, a bit more gender biased. But it's becoming less so. But I, in, in television, I mean, if you just read the credits, you'll see so many more female names uh, below the line than you do in film. Yeah, very true. Very true. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, that would be interesting to sort of discuss, you know, why that, why that is. Um, but, uh, but I, we, 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 cause I, I don't have, I don't know the answer, but, um, yeah, I don't either. So yeah. good thing we're not talk <laughs> yeah, about I that. was going to say, it's a good thing. I don't even have a theory, <laughs> but, um, but I did want to talk about your book. Um, uh, so LA, a Hollywood memoir. I did want to talk about this, um, you know, before, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I want to ask, you know, sort of, you know, what inspired you to actually write the book? I know you were working as a, a movie reporter. You know, you started doing, you know, uh, all this film work. You released the book in March of this year, 2017. So what was sort of the impetus to, to write this book? Well, I started writing it um, last year, just a couple of weeks before my birthday. It was a milestone birthday. And so that is really what made me think, you know, I've, I've lived a long enough life to be able to have an interesting story, but I, um, hold on just a second here. Hi, thank you. Sorry about that. That is something you can edit out. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to leave it in Stacey. Um, I think it's funny. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I just got a special delivery. It's my stack of cash for the next uh, movie I'm directing. Oh, nice. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So, yeah, so the impetus to write the book was uh, last year in my birthday month, and it was a milestone birthday. So I felt like it was time for me to tell my story because I had an interesting enough story with enough perspective to talk about it, but I'm still young enough and quote unquote with it to be able to tell the story to, you know, in an interesting manner. Uh, So that was part of it. And then another part of it is that um, with the, you know, advent of social media that people know who I am, but they express a lot of interest in my parents, my dad and my mom, and I'll post pictures and I'll get so many great responses, but their stories really haven't been told on a personal level. So for me, that was one of the reasons that I wanted to write too, was to kind of give my mom and dad stories and in a candid way, um, but definitely not, you know, a a mommy dearest kind of thing at all. But my mother, when I was growing up, she was an alcoholic and she went through some really tough times. And um, my parents divorced when I was very young. So there are things to talk about in that regard where it wasn't just, um, you know, a a, a whipped cream and fluffy clouds uh, childhood. So there's, you know, things that I want to talk about in that regard. And my parents did read the book after it was published and they both approved. (laughs) So that's good. So that's really what the impetus was because I feel like I have some pretty interesting stories to tell in a different perspective than probably most people. Yeah. And that, that sort of goes back to what I was mentioning too, was, you know, just growing up in LA uh, and and still living there is an interesting perspective. And I, I just want to ask Stacy, what is maybe just one, just one story from the book, maybe your most favorite or, or the most, uh, you know, interesting from you, from your <laughs> perspective, just something from the book. Maybe is there any, any, just one story you could tell from the book? Well, there are so many stories because it covers many different facets of my life. So, I mean, we could talk about the, um, 
very irate alcoholic monkey that my mom brought home one day when I was about seven years old (laughs) as my new pet, which was kind of fun. Uh, Or we could talk about, you know, why Malcolm McDowell told me I could call him my boyfriend uh, later (laughs) in life when I was interviewing him just about every week for the sci-fi channel. We had sort of this fun little relationship uh, and he's a great guy. Or we could talk about the the days of 1980s hair metal on the Sunset Strip. Oh, that was an, an odious time. Um, so, I mean, there's really a lot to talk about. So I couldn't really pick one story, but there's a lot of little little kernels. And, you know, part of my wanting to do this was to be able to tell these stories in a humorous way. So a lot of feedback that I'm getting is really gratifying and that people are finding even in the more, more difficult times in my life that there is always a temper of humor to it. You know, uh, one one story that I saw from um, from the from the Amazon homepage for your book was uh, partying at the Playboy Mansion, and um, I know this oh, yeah. is a, I, I I just every time I hear about the Playboy Mansion, the first thing I think of, and this just goes to show you where my head's at, Stacy, is Pauly Shore, because there's a story <laughs> that somebody once told about Pauly Shore where he every year every year he would you know he would be at a Playboy Mansion party. And he would go up and he would just tell everyone he was 30 years old. Well, finally, someone said, huh. you know, Paulie, you've been 30 years old for the past 20 years. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> you know, and it's just and they actually made light of it in the TV show Entourage. Uh, they actually brought that joke back, which I actually I thought was pretty cool. But, uh, oh, wow. but yeah, but, no, no, it was just it was, I just thought it was funny. But I mean, a play, partying at the Playboy Mansion in its heyday. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. That, that yeah, type of stuff like that. Back when it was exciting, yeah, it was really neat to be able to go to that part. I believe I was 19 years old, 18 or 19 years old at the time. And um, Hap's girlfriend, Carrie Lee, um, who I believe she sued him for palimony later on. But anyway, she was kind of out scouting the clubs for girls to invite to the parties. And um, so we went and my friend Peg and I, she was sort of my uh, bad influence, which every kid needs to have (laughs) if they're growing up, the bad influence friend. So we went and um, it was really interesting to see it back then, especially since there was still a mystique to it. Whereas now I did return for another party about three years ago and things had really changed quite a bit. And also just the public perspective of the Playboy Mansion. Now that it's been demystified, it's just not as exciting. It's actually kind of cheesy. So it's kind of neat for me to have that experience um, from the perspective of uh, of decades apart to see, you know, how it was in the in the 80s to how it is now. And so I do talk about that in the book. Yes. And another thing about my book that maybe historians will find interesting is that I am an architecture buff. So I do go into all the places that I visited and then talk a little bit about who built them and what their history is and what they look like. So those kind of things, um, you know, adding those details was really a lot of fun for me when I was writing the book too, to be able to do research on the things that I I really enjoy and to be able to tell stories about them from a different perspective, not just the salacious, you know, Playboy Mansion grotto perspective. So let me ask you, Stacey, it was, is the rainbow bar and grill as legendary as they say? (laughs) <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. There's been so much going on there throughout the years. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I did a, an interesting interview with the guys from L.A. Meekly. Um, we actually did our interview there at the Rainbow so we could talk about its history. And and it really has not changed its decor in, in many decades. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, Motorhead's uh, front man, Lemmy, used to hang out there. In fact, he practically lived there. He had rented an apartment just within stumbling distance so he could hang out there all the time. And when he passed away a couple of years ago, um, he was such a fixture at the Rainbow that uh, they had actually commissioned a bronze statue of him. And so he's still there at the bar. You know, cause I had a friend of mine out there who went out there and uh, he actually, you know, knew a few uh, uh, people who used to talk about the Rainbow Bar and Grill and they, they called the bow. And, uh, you know, and, uh-huh. uh, and, and no, he and I, I always and, and one of the guys that telling stories would always he was one of those guys that if you, he would always tell embellished stories. So I wanted to ask, you know what I mean? Like I wanted to ask you straight, you know, straight from you, Stacey, about uh, just about <laughs> if it's actually as legendary as they say. Yes, and I actually got to meet Jimmy Page there, who's my 
my hero growing up. I mean, I love Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin. That was my jam when I was a kid and a teenager. So I actually had gotten a fake ID out of the back of like Hit Parade or Cream magazine so I could go to the Rainbow when I was underage. And I saw quite a few really cool rock stars there. But my favorite sighting was definitely uh, Jimmy Page. And then it sort of came full circle when, as an entertainment reporter, I got to actually interview him for the documentary called It Might Get Loud. So it was really fantastic to be able to have my Jimmy Page moment um, on two totally different levels, one as a fangirl and one as a entertainment reporter. And see that that's why you know I'm glad we got to talk, Stacy, because you have those those sort of dual perspectives of things, um, seeing them as fans and then seeing them as an interviewer. I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I do too, and I really appreciate it. So I definitely talk about that in the book and and what it feels like to actually have those experiences. So um, hopefully, people will appreciate that aspect of it too. And I'll make sure to link uh, the, uh, the book in the show notes as well. And Stacy, I just want to ask. Uh, oh, no problem at all. I just want to ask also. You know what? What? What next? What? What do you have next in the pipeline? You know, are, are you what uh, sort of movies are you working on next? Well, I'm so immersed in the book right now and Psychotherapy's festival run that I don't have a lot um, ironed out yet. But my next hopeful project is to write and direct a documentary about the ventures because believe it or not, in spite of their incredible legacy and long running career, there's never been a documentary made about them. So if no one else is going to do it, why not me? Exactly. You, you see an opportunity or you see something that you would buy that's not out in the market and you go out and you create it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> So, Stacy, just in closing, I, I know we've been talking for about 40 minutes now. Uh, is there anything that we can get a chance to talk about that you maybe want to talk about now or anything you sort of want to say to put a period at the end of this whole conversation? Uh, only to say thank you so much for having me on the show and to talk about my various different things. I know it's it's sometimes difficult to concentrate on one specific line of questioning with someone who does so many different things, but um You know, I I really do appreciate having a forum like this to be able to talk to you and to talk to your listeners and um, just looking forward to uh, meeting everyone. So they can certainly find me online. And I I love to interact with folks who also enjoy film and music. And uh, thank you. And my my pleasure, Stacey. And I thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Where can people find you at online? Just about anywhere. <laughs> I can give you the rundown. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter as Stacy Wilson. That's S T A C I W I L S O N. And the same on Facebook. And then on Instagram, I'm Stacy Lane, which is my middle name. So that's S T A C I L A Y N E. And my website is stacylanewilson.com. So that's sort of the catch all for. If you forgot all those social media things, you can go to my website and contact me there. In fact, I encourage you to do so. And I'll link to all that in the show notes, everyone, at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis, or you can follow the podcast at DB Podcast. But I, I thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and I wish you the best of so luck much with fun. everything. Okay, cool. Thank you. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.